Okay, guys. Actually, okay, guys and gals. I was corrected at Expona. Several gals say they watch and wanted to make sure I include them. So, and I even shaved for them, too. So, anyway, guys and gals, great meeting a lot of you at Expona. This is one of the most fun shows, but also one of the most busy. So many now other things than just going to rooms with the Bach and uh, other business opportunities than meetings I had to do. Sorry I didn't get to every room. This is going to be my best of, but let me qualify that right off the bat. You can't use the word best. I, don't, I hate using that. Uh, it's best in terms of what my experiences were, but I couldn't go to every room and benchmark against every single uh, thing in there and especially spend enough time. So I want to do best of buckets of different metrics in this video and kind of save one of my favorites for last because I actually have a great interview in this room and some stories to tell you guys. And I wanted to save that. Didn't want it to get lost in the in the uh, debris of all these uploads because I really think it's uh, meaningful and helpful and a great takeaway from this show. But there's so many takeaways from this show. So what I want to start is with the bucket of new releases or new things I saw at this show that I know I will always associate with Exponent 2023, unique things, cool things. And right off the bat, starting on Thursday, was the Estelon Extreme Mark II. That was impressive. I got to say, uh, they hit the bar, the mark on every metric from aesthetics right off the bat, sound quality, uh, being able to set up in a difficult room. Now, I think that room was actually better than most others, uh, but it still wasn't perfect. But they played at the right volume, didn't have um, excite any modes. Uh, I was able to get really high-end performance in that room. Uh, the associated equipment, the Vetus, and everything else in there worked really well with it. So um, I would say, and what's innovative as well, never seen a speaker where you could adjust the height of the uh, MTM module relative to the base. And that's one thing I asked them to do during the demo. Well, after the demo, I asked them could they play a song and change it while it was playing so I could get a gauge on what differences it made. And it's very similar to what I have with my Wisdom Audio in a different way. It's not me mechanical, but the ability to overly, to ding up um, the sound between drivers or in a line source, it's a little different, but this gives you some of the advantages of a line source and presentation that's variable and height and different sound staging and interaction between the drivers that you don't get on most speakers. So yeah, it's an expensive speaker, but relative to what you get, aesthetics, piece of art, uh, family owned business, this is the type of business I like to support. I've had an interview with Alyssa, the CEO. I got to meet her father who uh, does the design work. Uh, they're from Estonia. This is A-plus company. Great job. I'll always remember this show for that debut of that speaker. And it's definitely, if you're a cost no object budget, it's one you want to definitely check out. Now, on the flip side, this show is also memorable for one of the most economical rooms. And I'll always remember this show for the Kabas room because those three and 4K all-in-one packages, DAC, AMP, DSP, speakers that give you serious level of performance where after that level you got diminishing returns pretty quick and i'll tell you this i i did kind of hint last year in the kibosh room i told you they're back in north america i've seen them in the past when they were they took a hiatus now they're back distributed by upscale audio i said be on the lookout for this brand i've always kind of lusted after having a full home theater with kibosh the modules because you could have easily have identical in every uh, surround sound channel and that be a big difference uh, but just for a two channel setup this was incredible and the litmus test not just my words two of my friends are putting their money where their mouth is they are buying uh, different models of those kibas so that's the ultimate litmus test as you've seen with me it shows when I buy something that's the biggest actually <laughs> right back here Albert Einstein's wearing my X uh, 9K Stax headphones. Oh, and let me tell you, I don't want to get off on, on the weeds too much, but this headphone, I used to think that my cell phone video didn't really capture as much as it does, uh, and you couldn't really tell much. Let me tell you, the whole paradigm shifted when I have these now. I was listening to one of my favorite rooms on my headphones in the plane, 
uh, and then on my regular headphones, and it didn't sound all that great. I'm like, oh man, it didn't really capture that majestic sound that I loved in that room. But when I came home and played down here, I was amazed how much it captured. Spatial cues, everything was so realistic. The purity, just everything is so great on these. So be careful. Obviously, in general, you want to be cautious about listening to headphones, uh, listening to YouTube videos. But the number one thing now I'm convinced is the limiting factor isn't YouTube or the recording mic. It's what you're playing it back on, whether it's your cell phone speakers, earbuds, or even inexpensive headphones that really aren't giving you, they're giving you totally different. I can do some A-B tests now that will really blow people's mind how good these are. Just with my videos recording in a room, the difference is night and day. But didn't want to get off on the weeds there. Wanted to just keep talking about the best of rooms for surprising. And heck, now that I'm talking about budget rooms like Cabas, I'll give kudos as well for a couple other budgetary rooms. Um, the Dutch and Dutch all-in-one active DSP, that's a little bit more expensive, 14000 But again, you get all the electronics, DSP, and it's super high performance. We're talking about on measurement metrics, you're not sacrificing much at all. So that's another price point that I would consider. And then also, I want to give props to the YouTube guys, uh, Thomas and Stereo and Jay Iyagi. Um, I think they're both from Canada. I almost skipped this room. It, they didn't even have their name on the tag. It said CSS, and I was going to Infigo and Alta Audio. I had a meeting at 2.30. I passed them up, not knowing. I went to Infigo and Alta, finished there, and as I was coming out, I still had some time. I just went in this room, CSS, and sure enough, I met Thomas from Thomas and Stereo. I didn't meet Jay, Jay Yagi, but I was able to at least spend a little time. I think I got one song in there, and I was very impressed with what I heard. Certainly at the budget that they are targeting, um, they were reaching a level of serious diminishing returns uh, in terms of the performance they were able to reach. Now, I only had one song. Obviously, if I played 200 songs, we're talking about a 35-watt tube amp, sure, you, you probably can find some things that you don't uh, think match up with cost no object. But in terms of if you're in that budget range and you wanna to get to a point of serious diminishing returns afterward, uh, that is definitely uh, was impressive, at least in my limited exposure. So kudos to those guys. And actually I'll give them some other props because so many YouTubers and really even more so <laughs> some of the print media guys have no idea what they're talking about, to be honest with you. <laughs> I've been in the room with these guys. They don't know what questions to ask. They have no idea what the guys are talking about. It's all over their head. They don't ever take the time to understand. They call themselves audiophiles, and that's fine. You can audiophile however you want. But when you're in the press, I think it's imperative that you learn more and you can understand at least technical talk and learn a little bit how things work, what the measurements mean, what that translates to your hearing. That makes you a better listener for your own purposes, but also if you're going to recommend to others what can translate to them versus just your subjective nebulous audiophile jargon. And so what I saw and applaud those two YouTubers is that building those things themselves, obviously they're probably contracting with an established firm, but they're through osmosis. They've obviously learned a lot. And so their reviews, uh, I'm not subscribed to them, but I'm, I'm going to be now because um, I have watched Thomas and Stereo with REL reviews in the past. And of course, Jay Ayagi had some, <laughs> some drama with Danny that I watched. But uh, now that, uh, and also in acoustic, I watched some of his stuff on that. But um, these are guys that now probably have a lot more intuition and knowledge of what makes things better or worse and what could be applicable. And so those kind of the YouTubers and reviews, I think I would elevate uh, in your hierarchy what you listen to online. So kudos to those guys. Great job. Um, I did put some notes because this show is so big. It is crazy. Um, I usually just do this off the cuff. But um to that end, the only thing I would caution those YouTubers about is that they're now in a budget of another bucket I want to talk about. Rooms that are so good, so much experience covering them, and I have to apologize to them because they, they deserve full treatment, but I just had to had to cherry pick what I do. And rooms like MBL, um, Linkwits, uh, even Acora, and, and 
Joseph Audio, I just know they're always so good, that, and I know that the benchmark is so high, and I can recommend them without any reservations. I didn't spend a whole lot of time in there. But another one I really feel bad about is Margulis. I had talked to the guys at Margulis at the mixer and planned to go out to visit their facility in Mexico. And what I'm saying is, tying into the YouTuber guys, they're kind of in that price point now with Margulis, which is another one that in that price ballpark, you are at serious diminishing returns. Uh, that's a very steep competition uh, for anybody in that realm. But really, those two, um, if that's the only competition you have, that's good news. But uh, Margulis, I didn't even have to go in that room. I thought Dave would go on into it, but he did. So apologize to our Margulis. They always get my thumbs up. Now, another room, though, that came back into the show scene like Kabas uh, this year was Von Gaylord. And they do it all. That's one of the brands that you rarely see. I did a, a video a while back, best brands that do it all. And uh, Von Gaylord is one that does it all, from speakers to DAX to amps. And they have different price points from economical to cost no object, really cool designs, really high performance. Uh, and when you have that synergy of everything being made by the same company, takes a lot of headaches off of you. I can tell you guys, just matching brands that are individually good doesn't always work together. And it's for actual legitimate electrical reasons in many cases, as I talked about recently with Harry Surratt amp that my friend bought. Um, again, don't wanna go into the weeds, but synergy makes a big difference. And that's gonna be one of my keys in my favorite room that I put at the end of this video. But trust me, Von Gaylord is one you want to look at. 100 watts, they could touch the tubes. Uh, the six year life, six to eight year life on those tubes, that's a definite brand. If you're into tube amplifiers, all in one company, look at Von Gaylord. Another one, I want to get into the category, oh, Wilson Banesh. That's another one that came back. Now, they were at the show last year with a bookshelf, well, a stand, I mean, a stand mount that was really high end. But I want to talk about this year they brought. A full suite of products got to talk to the people behind it and man that's an impressive speaker the isobaric bass meticulous finished awesome um oh, sorry i gotta take this call real quick okay guys sorry i'm going to coachella I'm trying to make last minute plans for everything um going to see the gorillas see the gorillas behind me watching some stuff getting psyched for this weekend i'll have plenty of footage from that so stay tuned on that but getting back to the coverage, I wanted to talk about, let me see, I was talking about Wilson Banesh with Aries Surratt gear in acoustic cabling. Great meeting those guys. In acoustics, one of my favorite cable brands. I'm actually going to be visiting their facility when I go to Munich next month for the Hi-Fi show. Um, Aries Surratt, they debuted this 300-pound DAC chassis. Again, you can't do much better than that for tube amplification. And they're another company, Aries Surratt, does everything. Uh, if cost is no object, you like tubes, you like state-of-the-art performance, looks, every metric like I was talking about for Estelon, Airy Surratt is your brand in acoustic cabling. People don't really copy that cable because it's too hard to copy and it's flexible. Great getting to know the guys behind that. Uh, a plus on the Wilson Banesh as well. It sounded great. Um, thumbs up. That was one of my takeaways and memorable parts of Exponent 23. Now, I want to get to another bucket of rooms, like people that, and it ties into a room that's going to be my favorite. The rooms where, again, sound is just one metric that these guys nail, but they always are able to set things up or and or pivot during the show to address concerns. And this is what I really look for. Um, I'm sure I don't see all of these instances, so there's lots of companies that can do this, but at least what I noticed at this show really stood out to me is how a manufacturer can pivot during the show to address issues. And one of them was David Jansen. Now it's KLH9, well we were using it in the Bach room, and I'll talk about the Bach in a minute, but the Bach room this was great, but he had the KLH9s, uh, kind of their redesign of them, updated for this century. <laughs> um, and I tell you what, this was a great sounding room, but he had a problem with one of the speakers later in the day. And you don't have a soldering iron, you don't have the parts, you, what can you do at that point? He was able to stay up late, get it. After our dinner, he found a way to get it working the next day. 
that's the kind of dedication, that's the kind of ingenuity, that's the kind of commitment and just ability to, to whatever, like no excuses, get it done is something that's a big takeaway. That's what I look for in companies, no excuses. And you know, as a customer, when you're doing business with these guys, you feel good supporting them. Um, and so that's one that does that. Another room, now, Acora didn't have a problem that I was aware of, but I noticed that early in the show, their, their seating was way far away from their speakers. And they're obviously in these huge rooms where reverb is much louder. And so for certain recordings and certain people's taste, that's not going to be, you're not really hearing the speaker as much as you're hearing the room. So as the weekend progressed, they put a speaker, uh, a chair right close to the speaker. Again, showcasing their knowledge to adapt to the situation, give you different vantage points and give you, at least for my taste, that was a great seat. Totally made that one of the best of the show. So depending on your taste and they even label some of the chairs for you. These are the kind of, um, skills that you want to look for in people that are setting up rooms more than just the sound quality aesthetics or price tag of gear another guy that sets up things perfectly and i think i even titled it does everything right dr vinyl great guy sets things up great great music taste that's another thing that i put into my equation and we'll save that thought um awesome guy awesome room Definitely a guy you could trust and a guy that I would definitely look at whatever he's offering see what uh, may work for you Let me see what my notes here if I'm leaving anybody out. Oh Okay Well source point eight. Let me jump to that one real quick because the two big names here are source point eight and PS audio So let me address those two source point eight Unbelievable the trickle down. I've heard of trickle down technology in speaker models, but you can't get more identical than what Andrew Jones was able to do from the 10 to the 8. And you save, I think, a thousand bucks and probably easier to place in a room. And if you mate with a sub, you're probably not gain, uh, sacrificing much at all. So kudos to him. I'm hoping when I'm in LA for Coachella, if I have time and his schedule works, I can visit his facility and um, see where he actually designs speakers, but not so sure it's going to happen. We'll see. Um, and then the PS audio, let's talk about that. There's very polarizing comments about whatever the recordings uh, showed. And in my case, I've had plenty of recordings from Dave and me going multiple times, trying to get that sweet spot because it was very busy. And I gotta say, um, there's a lot of things that you can't tell from that room. Just it was so busy, noise floor loud, and not getting always a sweet spot. And you don't even know if that's really the ideal place for that speaker. Um, at least when I went in there, I was impressed, generally speaking, not wowed, but impressed and think that in the right room with proper setup, uh, I think it has a lot of potential. Now, aesthetic wise, it's a leapfrog huge from his iterations before the Arnie Nudell ones that were not too good, both sound quality wise and aesthetic, in my opinion, when I heard him at Rocky Mountain. But so this is definitely a, a level above that. Would I say the looks though, even though it was black and white, which I really love, it just kind of looked like an air uh, purifier thing. Uh, the aesthetic still didn't resonate with me, uh, but if it does resonate with you, I think the potential is there in the right room to really sound good. It's right on that cusp of sounding like a speaker and sounding like music. And that's kind of what I look for is, can a speaker disappear? And that's what the difference really is from some of these budget speakers that get to that level. When you get the main difference isn't so much frequency response or particular metrics, but their ability to disappear and make you think you're at a live concert and give you that re extra level of realism is really what you want to look for when you're paying cost no object. And so the PS Audio didn't quite do that for me, but I think the potential is there. I wouldn't rule it out based on what I heard. I just wasn't wowed by it. Um, let's see what else. Okay, let me just go ahead and get to Bach because I don't want to, I didn't want to pimp Bach. I did enough videos there. I'm a dealer rep, so I don't want to talk about that too much. But one thing you will notice, almost nobody will shoot live video of people's reactions in their room. 
And one thing you'll notice, most people are shocked, and I did some after outside the room with Bob and um, some others came and told me how wild they were after. Several dealers, some people bought right in the room at, while I was there. Um, and then one thing you'll notice in those videos, you don't see people getting up. In fact, the difficulty was getting people to rotate out of that sweet spot such that more people could enjoy it. That was a problem in that room versus other rooms. It's constant musical chairs. So that was great takeaway that I've got those videos. But one thing I did want to talk about for the few naysayers that didn't get in the sweet spot or say or that but even if they get in the sweet spot, said, oh, my God, this is so dramatic, so different. We're so used to paying, you know, thousands for this much of a difference. How is it possible this big a difference is being made? And is that a gimmick? Is it not real? Is it processed? Is it, you know, gimmicky? And so one thing I did on a live video is had Edgar, you turn the room, hotel room, in a into a recording studio while the person, a random person in there, I went live, didn't even know him. He was had the mics in there and Edgar basically used that as a recorder to record his voice at 12 o'clock from the guy, 9 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 6, all around, and even whisper in his ear. Once he had that recording, guy took out the the uh, earphones, and then he played it back on the main system, where now you can see what you're hearing. It doesn't match with what you just were a participant at. And so what that really tells you with the Bach, you know, cures all this naysayers, is that, this is just revealing more of what's in the recording. When you hear something at nine o'clock, yeah, now you know you were at the recording. That's because it was at nine o'clock. And uh, you may still like cross talk and a collapsed sound stage way in front of you. So be it, whatever you like, you like. But this gives you the option now to hear much more reveal, much more of what is truly in the recording. And so that's a huge benefit. So that was, if you watch those videos, you won't see anybody getting out of that seat voluntarily. Nobody even leaving that room hardly. So uh, that was really fun. And the wow factor in that room was obviously as good as anything I've ever been at a show. But you had to get in that sweet spot. I was there last year and I didn't even know anything about it. <laughs> it wasn't until Capital Audio Fest. But now it's time for me to give my favorite room, obviously taking Bach out of the equation, for hitting all the marks in so many areas in terms of my enjoyment. And really what threw it over the top in this room is the music selection and his ability to set up in a very tight room that I didn't think he could ever get this level of performance. And it's Odyssey, Klaus with Odyssey. When I went into that room, <laughs> he didn't even know who I was. I've never really, I've known him for 20 years in terms of going to his room at shows, but I've never had interaction with him. And even at Capital Audio Fest, I sat off axis and we didn't have any interaction, but I always respect what he's done. But well, once he recognized who I was, evidently he watch, watches my channel and then recognized me and even wanted to give me some advice on you know, how to turn my channel in even bigger and, and different things, niches that he thinks I would be good at. And so I appreciated that advice. But really what I was there was to find out what is his secret because he does so well he, he likes to bitch about the rooms, but he knows he's getting super good. He's just a perfectionist. And what he gets in these small rooms is just incredible. Now he creates the ambience as well with the lighting and all that, and that's part of the deal, going that extra mile. Kudos to him for doing that. But independent of that, man, those speakers disappear. And I look at those speakers all the time. They're always cheaper than everything else in his gear, in his uh in his uh, inventory for system. And this time he was pairing it up with really expensive stores. And those speakers were not embarrassed at all. In fact, they fit in perfectly, recreated, um, well, brought Louis Armstrong back to life in that one track. And I wanna talk about that real quick because that's a track in a, that I've heard that I have remembered forever. All the shows I've gone to 20 plus years, you know, just in the last few years, how many rooms I've visited. I still remember hearing that track on a Joseph Audio System. I think it was in New York where they won Best of Sound at a Stereophile show. That's when Stereophile used to actually put on shows. Um, and when they did it with Manly Gear, I remember everything uh, in that room. And it would never, it, you know, I've never heard that track better than there. Well, this is the first time I heard it equal what I heard back then, if not beat it in some respects. And for him to get it in a much more difficult hotel room with budget gear uh, that, well, his budget speakers and his amps, 
that was a huge kudos. Plus, he played Keith Greninger's um, Looking for a Home. That's one of my, I mean, at these shows, when I hear a song that I haven't heard forever, like I've done in the past, I've talked about different songs that make my favorites. When you play a song that really resonates with me, I give you a little bit of bump up, and he hit that. He also played uh, a great Santana track, which if there was any other room in the entire show that got close to the level of Bach in terms of presenting 3D space um, around you in your ears, just that track by Santana was incredible on LP. And I'll give him credit as well. You know, Klaus's room is one of the few that can make me swallow my words about LP and versus digital. Now, again, it's only in isolated instances, but I, if I bought a vinyl rig, a, a turntable, the first album I would buy, it would be that St. James Infirmary by Louis Armstrong, because the, the it's just no co comparison between what's better. That one I agree with. It's totally better than the streaming version and everything version and everything I've ever compared that would be what I want it's a great album that level of performance I haven't been able to find in digital yet is it more the exception than the rule for me yes but I will acknowledge that is a definite reason for having a vinyl rig and I'm sure there's many other ones as well but for me that one always resonates uh, so again I have a full interview with him over 15 minutes I didn't want it to be buried in the uh, shrapnel of all the uploads. So I'm gonna upload that interview with Klaus of Odyssey separately, um, kind of as their award for doing such a great job this year and let you kind of digest. It goes through all the gear, even the stands, some of his philosophy, also the Magnan Cable, uh, which is a longstanding cable brand. You're gonna wanna hear some of that. In fact, I knew a lot about it because Steve McCormick and I, uh, uses those cables. And I even asked him about stuff about pouring the dielectric and well, there was a little bit of confusion during the, uh, the interview, as you'll see. But then he recognized what I was trying to get at after we got off camera. And he was telling me about an acoustic conductive paint that that's what I was thinking of that Dave Magnin used to use in the cables. And unfortunately, once the cables get a certain length of age, that conductive paint may crack he actually will repair legacy magnet cables. Uh, so that's a good thing to know if you're a magnet cable owner or if you're buying used, you may have that issue, but the, the current owner, kudos to him, and he's advanced Dave Magnet's designs uh, over the years. So I wanna give a kudos to that room. I'll have that interview soon. Hopefully you enjoy the coverage. Kudos to everybody I met. Great meeting all of you guys. Great job with the show. Uh, Axpona did a great job. Can't wait till next year, but I'm going to Munich next. Well, Coachella first, then Munich. So I'll see you back here soon.